The second lesson is from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. from his A Knock at Midnight. The church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool. If the church does not recapture its prophetic, prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. If the church does not participate actively in the struggle for peace and for economic and social racial justice, it will forfeit the loyalty of millions and cause people everywhere where to say that it, it has atrophied its will. But if the church will free itself from the shackles of a deadening status quo and recovering its great historic mission, will speak and act fearlessly and insistently in terms of justice and peace, it will enkindle the imagination of humankind and fire the souls of men and women, imbuing them with a glowing and ardent love for truth, justice, and peace. People far and near will know the church as a great fellowship of love that provides light and bread for lonely travelers at midnight. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to Praise you, Lord Christ. Lord Christ. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask that you fill us with the power of your spirit to do the things that you want us to do in seeking justice and truth for everyone in this world. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In our gospel reading of Luke today, it begins with Jesus teaching in the synagogue. But before he started there, well, let's just backtrack a little bit. He first was baptized in the River Jordan by John the baptizer. And it says that the spirit of the Lord descended on him in the form of a dove. And then it says the spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness where he was tested three times by the Satan. And when that was complete, then it says he began his ministry. But to me, the critical phrase is that he was filled with the power of the Spirit, filled with the power of the Spirit. Because we think of Jesus as fully human and that he did everything with his human powers, but actually he was filled with the power of the Spirit. And that's what enabled him to heal people, to teach, to cast out demons, and do all the things that he did because he was filled with the Spirit. This has important implications for us in that we think that we're fully human and we are, none of us are Jesus, <laughs> we're human, but we are told in our faith tradition that Christ is within us. And Paul writes that in all of his letters, in Romans, in Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Corinthians, Christ is within us. So that means that we are filled with the power of Christ that is in us. And this has huge implications for what we are called and empowered to do in this world. Now, Jesus when he got into the synagogue and started teaching with the power of the Holy Spirit, he read through the scroll, and I'd like to go to the end of it to see what he wrote there. He said, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. 
And the important word for me is today. Jesus wasn't telling the people, wait until I've been crucified and resurrected and come back again. Then I'm going to bring good news to the poor. He didn't say that. He said today. So it's not a future heaven. It's a today heaven. We're called into bringing about the heaven on earth today with Jesus in partnership. As we heard from Martin Luther King, he's telling, telling us that the church needs to be involved actively in promoting justice today, not tomorrow, not a future heaven, but today. Let's look at the work and the reading of what Jesus talked about. He begins by saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's like, what a wonderful Trinitarian statement that is. And then he says, I've been anointed to bring good news to the poor, to release the captives, bring sight to the blind, let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the word Lord's favor. What is the year of the Lord's favor? So let's look into that a little bit. And it goes back to Mosaic law. In Leviticus, the people of Israel were told to plant and cultivate and harvest for six years. But in the seventh year, they were not to plant or cultivate. They were simply to gather in what had grown. So what this did is it made the Israelites lean into their faith in God because they had to trust that there was going to be enough food that grew from the, the crops from the previous year and there had been enough food stored. So it taught them that. And after seven cycles of these seven-year periods, on the 50th year was the year of Jubilee. That's the year of the Lord's favor. And two very important things happened on that. First, all debts were canceled. And second, all slaves were freed. So let's look at why that would have been so important and why that was part of the, the law of the community that, that Moses gave the laws for. So if we look at, at debts, for instance, let's say you own a small plot of land and you had to sell your land because you needed money to pay for seeds or maybe buy a new cow or something, but then you were renting your land back. And so you didn't have the value of that land anymore. And so you'd become poorer and poorer over time. But after 50 years, that was wiped out and you were given your land back. How amazing is that? But for the second part, the freeing of slaves, let's say that you ran out of money and you needed to sell your labor into slavery. Well, for six years you were to do that, but in the seventh year you were to be freed. But if you chose to stay there, then on the Jubilee year, all slaves were freed, no matter what the circumstances. So what this had, the, the, what it did was it made sure that the rich people weren't accumulating all the land over and over again so that they had everything and the poor had nothing. This was a great reversal. And it was uh, very powerful what Jesus was doing. But it's like the good news is not just the year of the Lord's favor, the canceling of debts and the freeing of slaves. It goes much deeper than that. Jesus is saying that he's going to bring good news to the poor. And the good news is similar to what his mother Mary said in her Magnificat, that he's going to send the rich away empty-handed, and he's going to give, send the poor with, with, and fill their bellies with food. So he's leaning into what his mother taught him in the Magnificat about bringing good news to the poor. Because when we think about it, it's like, why are there poor people in the first place? I mean, Jesus said there's always going to be poor with us. It's not because God wants people to be poor. It's because of our own hard hearts and the systems that we have in the world which perpetuate and create poverty. Now, poverty is kind of like a, a sneaky thing because we think it's an individual problem and it's the individual's fault that they're poor. Well, that person over there, they didn't work. That's why they're poor. That person spent all their money. They went to Vegas. That's why they're poor. Or that person got sick and lost their money. But if we think about it, that narrows this problem of poverty into a very narrow focus. And it doesn't understand the complexity of it. Because poverty requires a community response, a community solution to really address it. Because the, the truth is, is that poverty is not an individual problem, which means that the, that charity is never a replacement for justice. Now, charity is very important. That's why we have Christian social concerns, because when people are hungry today, we need to give them bread. But we can't just stop there. We have to look at the greater justice and start working on the systems that create and perpetuate this poverty. Now, you might wonder, what is this poverty all about and how do these systems create and perpetuate it? Well, 
Some of you might have heard about what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma 100 years ago in the Greenwood neighborhood, which was an affluent black neighborhood. And this, they were doing well, but this inspired the anger of the white people in Tulsa. So they went and they burned it down. They destroyed 35 city blocks. They injured hundreds of people, killed probably 300 people. You might say, well, why does that matter? Because the wealth was destroyed and that's how people became poor. A recent Brookings Institute study shows that black families on average have one-tenth the wealth of white families. And you might say, well, that's because of their individual circumstances, but it's also because of the system. Imagine what would have happened if the wealth in Tulsa had stayed with the black families. I don't think there would be a wealth disparity in Tulsa. So when you look at what's, what's happening is that there are systems that take away wealth. If we look at our own federal government with redlining in the 1930s, they literally took maps and drew red lines with pencils and said, don't lend in these areas. So if you didn't get a mortgage, you weren't able to build wealth and equity. And so you, you paid rent all your life. It didn't have anything to show for that. We know here in California, most of individual wealth comes from land appreciation. And if you live in Monterey County and own your own home, last year, you probably saw an increase of 25% in the value of your home. So imagine, all that compounded wealth that didn't get to go into the black neighborhoods or the red line neighborhoods. And even today, 90 years later, the effects of that redlining still persist in something that's called social vulnerability, where the neighborhoods tend to have more poverty, more crime, lower life expectancy, and other problems, all relating back to those decisions that were made back then. One last example, something as simple as water. Well, we take it for granted here in the peninsula. Well, maybe not if you've seen my water bill, but it's a lot of water is coming through lead pipes. This really came to our attention in Flint, Michigan, when there was so much lead in the water that they had to do something about it. And you would think that now that's been solved nationwide, but it hasn't. There are still millions of people getting their water through pipes with lead. And we know what happens when children drink water with lead in it, it kind of destroys their brains. So imagine if they grow up, they're not capable then of earning the kind of living. So again, wealth is being destroyed through this, this factor. And Chicago has a very bad lead water, lead pipe problem. They have over 400,000 pipes with lead that are leading into people's homes. Now they are addressing it, but they say that it's gonna take them 50 years to get it done because they're only allocating a few million dollars when it will actually take a few billion dollars. So again, we look at the justice and how systems come together to create and perpetuate poverty. When Martin Luther King was talking about the things that we are to do, it's not just giving bread to the hungry person, but it's joined, joining together to solve the big problems and bring justice to the world. So here at St. Mary's 19 years ago, some people got together along with a few other institutions and decided they wanted to use the power of Christ within them to start to bring some justice to this world. And they started a group called COPA, which stands for Communities Organized for Relational Power in Action. And what this did is that it banded together to bring the collective power of institutions to play so that justice could be brought to systems. And today there's 28 institutions all over Monterey County and Santa Cruz County that are doing amazing things. Now, the way it works is that, is that we have house meetings where we listen to the concerns of the community and then we act. So a few years ago, we were hearing that undocumented workers were not getting health care because they couldn't afford it and they weren't allowed to have health care insurance through Medi-Cal. So we got together and listened to the stories. We went to the County Board of Supervisors and convinced them to create Esperanza Care, which provided health care payments for undocumented people. What a beautiful thing, changing the whole trajectory of people's lives. During COVID, we started hearing stories in our house meetings from people in Salinas and farm workers that they weren't getting support for COVID. They might be told to isolate or quarantine, but then they had no resources to do so. Or they might be infected, and worse, they had no way to go out of the house to get diapers for their children or food or even milk. We heard those stories. We took them to the Board of Supervisors and three days before Christmas in December of 2020, 
they had a special meeting and voted to allocate $4.9 million to fund the positions of 100 community health workers. And these were mostly women, mostly in the communities that were most affected. And so they've gone out and done tremendous things, but it's, it's more than just saving lives. When, and I, I'm sure that lives were saved because they were out there providing information and quarantine, and, but it's also changing the lives of the women that are working for them. So now they have the authority and respect in the community of having this amazing position. So when you work together, then we can begin to solve institutional problems. Now, COPA might not be your cup of tea, and that's okay. The point is to find a way that you can join in institutional power. Because as Martin Luther King said, if the churches need to come together and demonstrate their power in the community and bring about the justice and truth and peace that we're all called to do. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you have filled us with the love of Christ so that we can be empowered to be your love and peace and to bring about justice in this world. And so that when we talk about the good news for the poor, it really is the good news. So give us this uh, ardent love for truth and justice and peace and inspire us in all these ways and give us the courage to act. All this we ask in the name of the risen Jesus. Amen.